So they see Israel not only as an ally, but as an instrumental country to subjugate the people in the region, because in the past at least 40 to uh, 50 years, four to five decades, the strategy of the United States in the region was turn the neighbors against each other, create wars, and then sell weapons uh, for these countries, right? So Israel's instrumental role is to continue this role of continuing the mayhem in the region. So therefore, the United States nowadays sees that Israel is very important for its own sake as an empire and its own survival as an empire so that they can prolong the life of uh, the U.S. as a, a dominant power over the world. It is March 4th, 2024, and the United States is now airdropping aid into Gaza in what they are calling an emergency humanitarian mission. The only question becomes, why now? Why did it take them nearly five months at a time when they were looking at the Gaza Strip and realizing that over half a million Palestinians are on the brink of famine? Was it that the death toll has surpassed 30,000 Palestinians killed, the majority of them women and children, and this ongoing bombardment carried out by Israel made possible by the United States? Or was it the fact that Israel opened fire on hundreds of Palestinian civilians last week around an aid convoy, hundreds of starving Palestinians who were just trying to get access to the aid that they desperately needed? It seems as though the Biden administration is working in overtime to distract from the fact that Israel is now firing openly on starving civilians for the fact that there's not that ceasefire that Biden was promising when he was trying to get votes in Michigan. And speaking of Biden, he's now realizing that Gaza is not going away. The plight of the Palestinian people is they're being ethnically cleansed by Israel with the help of the U.S. is not going away. We discussed all of that earlier with a special guest, so let's take a listen to that conversation now. Joining me now to discuss is Kavorik Almasian, a political commentator and founder of Syriana Analysis. Kavorik, thanks so much for taking the time to join me again. Thank you very much for having me. It's always a pleasure. It's always good to have you on the show. I wanted to talk to you about the latest coming out of Gaza. I know that the U.S. military airdropped around 38,000 meals in Gaza over the weekend in what it is calling an emergency humanitarian aid operation. We know that obviously more than half a million Palestinians are on the brink of famine. Several children have already died from starvation. Why do you think that they are taking this action now? And how much of this is to distract from the massacre that we saw in which Israel opened fire on hundreds of Palestinians around an aid convoy? What is happening in the Gaza Strip is horrendous. It's beyond imagination. There is no sane person who could accept what Israel is doing in the Gaza Strip and what the United States is uh, doing in the Gaza Strip because, in my opinion, the United States is complicit with uh, the Israelis. They are providing Israel with the military equipment, with the ammunition, and also the supply lines. At, up until this moment, the United States has an aerial bridge to Israel, and they're providing Israel in whatever they need in order to continue the operations. Since the start of these hostilities in the Gaza Strip, Israel has used around half uh, half of its, so 50% of its ammunition uh, uh, over the heads of the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. And we were speaking about a very tiny, small geography in the Middle East, killing over 30,000 civilians. The vast majority of them are women and children. So this is the context of what's happening there. However, the in the United States, they have... the also side calculations, sub-calculations, and one of which is that this is an election year and Biden is uh, going to participate in the elections, and if not Biden, the Democrats, so they, their reputation is at stake. And w the grassroots of the Democrats, some of which are from what they call the Gen Z, and these people nowadays you can see that actively opposing what Biden is doing or what type of complicity is uh, Biden is involved. So Biden lost some of his popularity among the Gen Z and also lost the Muslim communities completely. So he has to pretend and he has to show them that he is doing something to uplift the humanitarian situation there.
So he is dropping these uh, food uh, food baskets or the humanitarian assistance via the uh, parachutes. And I watch these videos, and I also watch some of the amateur videos that were posted by the people in the in in, in Gaza. Some of which by uh, similar age, like in uh, men in my own age, and they were saying like they were opening the cartons and they see. Uh, women uh, stuff for necessary only for women, for example, right? And uh, they were really shocked. Like they are, there is malnutrition there, and they are receiving tampons, for example, from 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 Biden in 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 the Gaza Strip. So this is a show for the American public that the United States is trying to do something or is doing something there. But this shows uh, another weakness for the Biden administration that he is unable to persuade or convince his own ally in Tel Aviv, in Israel, to allow this humanitarian aid to flow into the Gaza Strip through the formal official gates, through the Rafah or through the Israeli uh, gates, right? Netanyahu is humiliating here Biden. And in my opinion, what happened there is a scandalous and it's it shows how the United States is nowadays under extreme uh, influence of uh, Israel and not vice versa. We always discussed who has more influence or leverage on the other, right? It's the United States who can force Israel to do something or the Israelis can force the United States to do something. And now we see that the Zionist lobby and the neocons, because they... Uh, there is this uh, intermarriage, right, of interest between them. And they are in full control of the U.S. foreign policy. So whatever Netanyahu wants, whatever the Motriches want, wh- whatever the Smotriches want, whatever the Ben Gavirs want in Israel, which is uh, a crazy idea of ethnically cleansing the Palestinians from Gaza and then from the West Bank, this is this is something that they speak about it publicly. We're not trying to analyze here, right? Uh, Biden is complicit in this. And in my opinion, this, uh, uh, for example, I saw a tweet for the former U.S. ambassador to Syria, uh, Jeffrey. Uh, I forgot his name. I sometimes forgot names, but his name is Jeffrey. And he was speaking about that for in the in the past 70 years, the United States has not been humiliated as is the case today, and it's in the ha- from on the hands of its own ally, Israel. Everybody is upset uh, by Israel, but nobody is able to stop Israel. That's the problem. Yeah, and you would think that the U.S. would be the country who would have the most leverage at the end of the day. Like, surely if they were to say, you know what, we are going to stop the military support, the political support, the public support, that Israel would be forced to change course. But not only is that not happening, but you have the U.S. doubling down at the United Nations Security Council recently, where they vetoed yet another resolution involving Israel. Now, this resolution wasn't even calling for a ceasefire it was specifically calling for the condemnation of Israel for the fact that it carried out what is being called the Flower Massacre, in which it killed over 100 Palestinians around an aid convoy and injured hundreds other hundreds of others. So what does that tell us when Washington refuses to really even condemn anything that Israel does, including when it's open, opening fire on hundreds of starving civilians? Actually, the footage uh, coming from the drone footage, the amateur footage that we watched, it it shows clear evidence that the Israeli forces opened fire on starving uh, Palestinians. And then the Israeli officials did this usual Hasbara, and they blamed the starving uh, Palestinians for trying to get food. Imagine that you uh, corner 2.2 million people in a very small uh, geography, you starve them, you cut the electricity, you cut the food, uh, there is no drinking water there, and you have dropped bombs uh, equivalent to few Na- Hiroshima and Nagasaki's over their heads, and then blame them if they try to physically uh, try to get 
the food from the trucks that recently entered into the Gaza Strip. I mean, the audacity of Israel is beyond me when they try to blame the Palestinians for uh, uh, trying to climb over someone. It's a human nature. It's a survival mode. No, these people have never lived on a survival mode to understand what we are talking about. When, when a person is starving and there is uh, this uh, recent... Uh, movie on Netflix, everybody has to watch it. And it speaks about a plane that falls uh, in Ch over Chile in the 70s. And how at the end of the day, uh, this is a true story, uh, humans started eating the dead bodies of human beings. And this is th this is true story. So these things are very, very serious. You cannot push humans into the edge of starvation. Secondly, the United States is an empire. Everybody has to understand how the empire operates. The empire operates through having its uh, military installations around the world in order to exert power, right? However, there are also, in other cases, the United States doesn't have to have its own military personnel, but have strategic allies who are doing the bidding of the United States, one of which is Israel in the Middle East. The second is, for example, Taiwan. The third is, for example, Ukraine. Those are ad, uh, advanced satellite geographies for the United States in order to project and its its uh, power over the rest of the world, and also in order to subjugate the uh, the enemies or the competitors or the foes of the United States. And in this regard. The, the best who explained the situation of Israel was RFK. And you know RFK, he is very pro-Israel. And when they ask him, like, you have been correct on Ukraine, you have been correct on the pharmaceutical industries, you've been correct on the CIA, what's wrong with you when it comes to Israel? <laughs> and he says, Israel... He says, Israel is our ears and eyes in the Middle East, and they collect information for us, and they help us in, in the Middle East. And the Middle East is a very, he says, the, Israel is an aircraft carrier for the United States in the region, and we need Israel. So they see Israel not only as an ally, but as an instrumental country to subjugate the people in the region, because in the past at least 40 to uh, 50 years, four to five decades, the strategy of the United States in the region was turn the neighbors against each other, create wars, and then sell weapons uh, for these countries, right? So Israel's instrumental role is to continue this role of continuing the mayhem in the region. So therefore, the United States nowadays sees that Israel is very important for its own sake as an empire and its own survival as an empire so that they can prolong the life of uh, the U.S. as a, a dominant power over the world. However, we have to understand that the, cal the calculations that the Americans are making is counterproductive and they're shooting themselves in the leg because if there was no alternative powers rising and the Americans were the only dominant power, then this strategy could work, right? But when you have other powers rising, such as China and such as uh, Russia, and these powers are uh, showing the, the people, I'm specifically talking about the Middle East, telling them there is an alternative model. We can together grow up. We can together grow and our economies can grow together. We can deal among each other peacefully. And I come here as a stable, uh, like I stabilize the region for you. And then we continue trading among each other. So trade, business, technologies, and uh, civilizational relationship is the main, are the main factors, right? So the people in the region can see the difference when they have a positive impact over in their lives, thanks to the Chinese investment, for example, in the Middle East or in Africa or in Latin America. So the Americans are losing the battle for reputation and losing the battle for gaining the hearts and the minds of the people. And those are important things because the United States has a big, uh, for example, they can manufacture uh, Im image and they have a strong PR represented by the Hollywood, represented by the music industry, represented by the cultural scene in the United States. But this is all, uh, it doesn't feed the people in the region. You can sell them the illusion that the United States is the greatest country in the world. The United States is here to help the, the people of the world to spread democracy and human rights. But the people's 
direct interaction and experience with the U.S. in the region is negative, right? Therefore, they see to uh, f- uh, liber- they seek to liberate themselves from this misery and this situation that they are in right now by seeking better relationship with Russia and better relationship with China. And this is angering the United States, and they don't want for the people in the region to uh, become free and to develop again, because if the people start dealing with China in the the, uh, Chinese yuan, for example, and abandon the dollar, the United States will lose its status as a dominant uh, player. So their mentality is stuck in the Cold War era, and they want to subjugate the world only through military means and hard power. And this is no more uh, uh, effective, in my opinion, because we have other players, especially in the Middle East, like Iran, like Saudi Arabia, uh, are increasingly playing independent roles. So the United States, in my opinion, um, is in a, in a really, really dark place at the moment, very dark place. And what's going to happen next is that the ICJ will see if 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 Israel is committing genocide and violated the, uh, the Genocide Convention. And if they find that Israel did, which is... Uh, uh, highly likely that they would come to that conclusion, then the United States will be also taken to the ICJ because uh, they will be considered complicit. And uh, and the the convention for the genocide is very clear that the countries or the government should not help a genocide perpetrator and they have a responsibility to prevent genocide. So in this case, the Yemenis could be considered the Yemenis blockade on the American and the British and the Israeli cargo ships could be considered preventing ge- attempt to prevent genocide. And in comparison to what the United States is doing, it's complicity, right? But the world is upside down and they blame the Yemenis for doing what they're doing. And the Americans, uh, unfortunately, help to Israel is considered uh, humanitarian, you know? Yeah, that's a great point there. And I know when it comes to that ICJ case, it's been interesting because they came out and they told Israel, hey, we need you to report back in a month. We are calling on you to do everything in your power to prevent genocide. It feels as though Israel has taken those orders and done the exact opposite of that because now they're currently threatening a ground invasion of Rafah, even though you have countless international warnings about the fact that that would create yet another humanitarian catastrophe. And even when it comes to these attempts to have some sort of talks related to a ceasefire deal in Gaza that would include the release of the remaining Israeli hostages. You've seen Israel strike down every offer that Hamas has put on the table. And while Hamas sent a delegation to Egypt over the weekend, Israel boycotted that meeting with reports (laughs) claiming that Netanyahu was demanding a list of the names of hostages who are still alive. Has it become clearer than ever at this point that Israel and Netanyahu especially do not want to see an end to this war? They declared the goal clearly. It's an ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians in Gaza. So what's how they can do it? They have to bring all the people from the north to the south, near the borders with uh, Egypt in Rafah border crossing. And then they invade this region and they bombard the region. So they create an influx, an exodus of the, peop- of the people to Egypt. They were planning this and they were leaked documents about this and how they are even ready to finance what they call tent cities in uh, Sinai, in Egypt. And then from Sinai, they want to encourage uh, the peop- the Europeans to take the Palestinian refugees. And in my my information here in Germany says that the, the, the committees in European governments, they already discussed how, the quotas, how many Palestinians they are going to receive when this scenario happens. And in my opinion, they know that this this uh, scenario is very plausible and it could happen at any moment. So, and they will not do anything against it. Rest assured, it's the opposition for the Israeli invasion of Rafah is only verbal because uh, the, um, the United States, Germany, and other Western nations, they have uh, the tools to stop it. And one of which is, stop sending the arms to uh, to Israel, right? And Germany has increased its supply of weapons to Israel 
the United States increased its supply of weapons to Israel. So what does that indicate? How can you say on one hand that you are against the invasion of Rafah, and at the same time you provide every means necessary, every tool necessary, every weapon necessary for the Netanyahu government to wage this attack, right? So the hypocrisy is uh, staggering here. It's beyond, uh, it's sickening. And I think that uh, if the Biden administration or the European governments were honest and they really want to help the Palestinians, they have all the means in their hands to do it because Israel Israel doesn't have the capacity to produce all this weaponry and ammunition and also repairing their hardware in a... Um, uh, 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 in a record time in order to sustain in these hostilities against uh, the Gaza, let alone against Lebanon. And remember what happened uh, in Lebanon. The Israelis now tried to uh, to invade inside Lebanon uh, at night. And this happened only uh, when the Israelis say that, uh, and the American, uh, sorry, the Americans say that they shouldn't go to Rafah. But at the same time, they sent an envoy. By the way, his name is Hochstein. This Hochstein, I just checked his background, and apparently, the American envoy to Lebanon. He was born in Israel. He served in the Israeli army, and he works as an American diplomat today. And he was in Lebanon delivering. Uh, um, a, a few uh, suggestions and solutions to the Lebanese government so that the Lebanese government discusses it with uh, with Hezbollah. And uh, they say that these solutions include that Hezbollah would withdraw its heavy weaponry to the north of the Litani River. And they call this a realistic suggestion. And I truly do not know if, who is more stupid here. Is it the Americans who sent this envoy or the Israelis who think that Hezbollah will withdraw its hard, hard, or, uh, hard weapons to the north of Litani? Because Hezbollah doesn't have official military installations. Uh, the vast majority of their weapons are stored uh, in, in the tunnels and the bunkers underneath the, the, the ground. And if they want to move it to the north of the Litani River, they either have to take it out of these bunkers and carry it to the north of Litani, or they have to dig in new tunnels under the ground to take it to the north of Litani. And they call this solution to the realistic suggestions from the United States. I truly do not understand uh, how can a diplomat come from Washington, D.C. to Lebanon, bringing with him in a suitcase such solutions, solutions, <laughs> because what... what What's in their mind is um, that Israeli settlers in northern Israel, they were around 200 settlers. They left their apartments, their uh, se uh, illegal settlements, right? And they want them to come back. And this is uh, creating a big economic uh, and socioeconomic burden on the Israeli government. So, And also, it is destroying the concept of Israel is, Israeli concept is based on a concept that if you're a Jewish person around the world, you have you have a safe haven in Israel and you have a birthright to come back to Israel, right? And Hezbollah destroyed that by keeping the entire north unstable, destabilized, that all these settlers have fled to the south, to the central and the southern parts of Israel, then Hezbollah managed and succeeded in achieving this, this point against Israel. So they want that to restore this, right? So they sent this American envoy, American Israeli envoy to, to Lebanon to discuss this. Will Hezbollah follow it? Of course not. Like, there is no one uh, sane person, in uh, in my opinion, who believes that uh, Hezbollah will withdraw whether its forces to the north of Litani or its weapons to the north of Litani. And the proof of that is what happened with Israel just now, that the Israelis tried to invade Lebanon and the Hezbollah fighters, they repelled the attack. They were trying to uh, wage a ground offensive inside Lebanon. So... It's not going to happen. If it happens, 
it, it, it means that uh, the Israelis have created a buffer zone between Lebanon and Israel, and this is something they were trying to do for a long time. They tried to do it with military means. They invaded Lebanon in 2006, and they couldn't do it. So imagine why would Hezbollah give, it, give this to them um, on a golden plate, right? They will not do that, in my opinion. And uh, the, 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 the American mentality that is governing in D.C. is very delusional. And um, they don't see the balance of power anymore in the region. And they are miscalculating everything. And in my opinion, Israel is also miscalculating in this uh, particular case. If Israel invades Lebanon, and I'm speaking this from a position of someone been following Hezbollah's growth since 2006, I truly believe that this will, this will mean a strategic defeat for Israel. They will not be able to occupy any inch inside of the Lebanese territories. And what is going to happen is the, exactly the opposite. Hezbollah fighters have been training since 2006 for an offensive. And they will occupy the northern Galil and they will uh, uh, fixate their forces there, and Israel will lose territories this time. And that means that the Americans have to intervene directly. And I think the Israelis, uh, Israelis know about these cases, and recently there was a report published by uh, over 100 Israeli security, military, and political officials. They studied the growth of Hezbollah, and they are saying the same thing that I'm saying right now, that the going to war against uh, Lebanon is catastrophic, and it's not about the F-16s flying to bomb Lebanon. The question is, where are they going to land? They will not have uh, airports to come back and land because Hezbollah will destroy all the Israeli airports and the ports, all the strategic locations that you can imagine of. So. Um, Israelis know this, and they know that they are also in trouble in, in the Gaza Strip. They are unable to achieve uh, a decisive military uh, victory there. So by trying to open a second front against Lebanon, this will drag the Americans into this conflict to uh, score a decisive victory or in a bid to score a decisive victory against their enemies. That The question here is what, what then uh, Iran will do in this regard? Do the people think that Iran will stay um, like on the side and not do anything about its allies? So all this together, it just shows the crazy, crazy and maniacal mentality in Tel Aviv and what they're trying to do here in, in, in the region. It's, an, it's a scenario of an Armageddon and they talk about it like it's a, it's like they're eating a candy, you know. Like nobody wants this war in the region, and I don't understand why we, when we oppose such wars, we are the ones uh, called uh, uh, like we're spreading Hamas talking points, you know, or Hezbollah talking points. We are opposing the war, and we're also protecting the Jewish people because if this war happens. It, it, what happened on the October seven is going to be uh, uh, it's going to be a journey compared to what Hezbollah can do. So, mm -hmm. is the world ready for another war that could kill? Of course, it will kill from both sides, but also it will kill Jewish people. Why not stopping this war and imposing a ceasefire on Israel? It's just I don't understand seriously, as if they want this war. Yeah, it, it's that seems to be the case, and it's interesting to watch, especially the <laughs> neocons in Washington. They love to toe that line of trying to spread as much war propaganda as they can, but of course, they're not the ones fighting on the front lines at the end of the day. They're just the ones who are profiting from all of this, and that has been the case for a long time now, unfortunately. A lot of moving parts here, and I really appreciate you taking the time to join me today to break down the latest. Kaborik Almasian, a political commentator and founder of Syriana Analysis, thank you so much for your time and insight today. Thank you very much for inviting me. It was always, It's always my pleasure.